Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for um, for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk uh, in this in this online mode. Of course, I also want to start by congratulating uh, Deepak on his uh, on this uh, very nice and well deserved uh, Boltzmann Medal. I have actually a rather distinct memory of when I first uh, heard about Deepak's work. I, this was about 35 years ago. I was working on my PhD with Herbert on the KPZ equation. And uh, it, it may not be known to everybody, but among Deepak's many achievements is actually also the first analytic derivation of the famous uh, dynamic exponent three halves for a, a discrete model in the KPZ class. And my problem at the time was that Deepak didn't really publish this result. So there was a kind of one page paper in a somewhat obscure journal, more like an abstract, and so to me, it seemed a little bit like, like Fermat's last theorem, so something sort of scribbled on the edge of a, of, of a notebook without ever, without really knowing what it was. Um, and, and so uh, this, is, this is a citation here, a phase transitions 1987. And this is what Herbert and, and I wrote in the review about the KPZ equation that appeared shortly after this. So it is claimed that the dynamic exponent z equal to three half follows from considering the low lying excitations. So this was referring to the beta ansatz. No details are available yet. Um, so the rest is history, as, as we say. So, so um, of course, a lot of details have been filled in uh, by many people, and this has developed into a very remarkable field of research. But of course, Deepak has done a lot of other things as well, and, and, and in particular, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the, the success story of self-organized criticality, which sort of started at the same time. Okay, so, so what I want to do today is to tell you uh, a story about fitness landscapes uh, that change in time and a rather remarkable mapping to a, a, a simple model of random magnets that we discovered recently. This, is, uh, this work is driven very much by Suman Das, a postdoc in my group who, as far as I understand, is also an academic grandson of Deepak's uh, and uh, by Muiti Mungan, who joined us from the University of Bonn uh, recently. Um, one more thing I want to say is that although I understand that this is not so easy within this format, if, if you have any questions in between, so please um, uh, uh, take a microphone and, and ask uh, uh, so, that, so that I can answer it. Okay, uh, DP, so everything is, is technically okay, right? Can some, someone give me a kind of heads up? I cannot see you, so you have, somebody has to speak. Yeah, we can hear you and everything is fine. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's get started. So I always like to start uh, these, um, uh, this talk with a kind of historical uh, slide. So this is from uh, a paper by Sewell Wright uh, some, some 90 years ago, where he first introduced the idea of biological fitness landscapes. And, and this paper contains uh, two figures. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see uh, a graphical depiction of, of the, the, the different combinations of, of variants of, of genes, so what geneticists call alleles. And so essentially you have here, you have the, the kind of original uh, type of the population, and then you have here uh, two possible mutations in two genes, say, and here you have the double mutant. Here you have three combinations, combinations of three genes, four genes, and, and five genes, and so on. And, and although the, 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 the structure of DNA wasn't really known at this point, uh, Sewell Wright, of course, knew very well that the state space on which uh, genetic evolution is acting is actually this uh, object here, which will actually play a very uh, crucial role throughout this talk. And so if you, if you now want to assign a fitness value to each of these combinations, this is really a function defined on the space. Now, this is, of course, uh, notoriously difficult to visualize, and so to visualize things, he also added this other picture, which is more like a topographic map on two-dimensional space. Uh, and, and so this is now a landscape in two dimensions, which has peaks and valleys. But Sewell Wright also said already in this paper that he knew that this figure is a very inadequate representation of the situation. Nevertheless, in some sense, this figure uh, became very widespread and has become an important metaphor for discussing all kinds of problems in, in evolutionary biology. Now, what, what, what has changed in this field over the last 15 or 20 years or so is that we're now beginning to, to, to be able to actually look at fitness landscapes 
in the, 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 the proper setting. So this is a, a, an example from, from our own work from uh, uh, some, some years ago. Um, and, and this is a picture of a, of a kind that you will be seeing throughout this talk. So this is based on data that was obtained more than 20 years ago by my collaborator, Ariane de Fischer at the University of Wageningen. And it contains all 32 mutations, uh, all, all 32 combinations of five mutations in a particular fungus, right? So whenever there's, so this is encoded by a, a sequence of length five. So whenever there is a zero, you have the original type. And if you have uh, in that particular chromosome, and uh, if there is a one, you have a, have a mutation. And so you see that this gives you this five dimensional cube. And, and so Ariane, in a kind of heroic effort, measured the fitness values, that is the growth rates for all these different variants. And, and this is what you get. And so the, the representation that I'm using here and that I'm going to use throughout the, the talk is to draw these arrows. So these arrows always connect to mutational neighbors. So neighbors that differ by one letter in the sequence and the arrows point in the direction of increase in fitness. So you can sort of imagine the evolutionary process being sort of moving along this, this oriented graph. So this was this is now almost uh, you know, 12 or 15 years ago. Um, meanwhile, of course, the, the um, various techniques have, have been improved enormously. So just to sort of give you an example of, of the state of the art in the analysis of empirical fitness landscapes, this is a recent paper from the group of Michael Desai, which plots a fitness landscape that has been very relevant to all of us in recent years. So this is the, the, these are all combinations of 15 of the 15 mutations that separate the ancestral Wuhan strain from the Omicron strain of the coronavirus. And here you can already see that this is, you know, drawing this on a 15 dimensional hypercube is not that easy. So what is depicted here instead is a kind of radial coordinate. So this is the number of mutations from zero up to 15. And these are all the, the, the values of the affinity specifically of the virus to the receptor protein in the human cells. And what you can sort of see is that on average, there's a kind of valley here that the virus has had to cross in order to reach this uh, uh, more fit, that is more um, contagious um, Omicron variant. Um, so so let, let me sort of just summarize uh, the, the, the mathematical framework that I will be using. So as I said already, we will be encoding these, these types, what we call genotypes by binary sequences where zero denotes the absence and the one denotes the presence of a mutation. And the fitness landscape is then a function on, on this uh, L dimensional space. And of course, uh, for statistical physicists, it's very natural to think about this as an energy function of a spin system, except that here, uh, uh, the, the favorite states are those of high fitness rather than low energy. And then you can, you can sort of orient uh, the hypercube uh, along the fitness value. So in this picture, I sort of drawn the, or indicated the fitness values by the sizes of these circles and the arrows go in the direction of increase in fitness. So here you have a slightly more uh, sort of interesting graph uh, where there are actually two local peaks now. And so some of these arrows have been sort of switched around. So, so this fitness graph is, is an oriented graph uh, that you obtain by orienting the links in the direction of increasing fitness. And so here you, you can now, so I will not, not be saying very much about evolutionary dynamics, but very roughly you can, you can think about a dynamical process here following the, these uh, arrows. And then of course, uh, uh, if, 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 uh, and this implies then that the fitness increases monotonically along the path. So such path we call accessible. Um, and, uh, and this, of course, entails a possibility that a population can get stuck, for example, in this peak rather than going to the highest fitness peak, which is over here. And so this idea of, of, of a fitness landscape having many peaks and, and uh, populations getting stuck on these peaks is something that uh, was very much on the, on the mind already of Sewell Wright. So this is an image of his that also indicates his dual uh, talents as a, as a theoretician and an experimentalist who worked with guinea pigs. Um, so, so what he says here is that in a rugged field of this character, so this is what, what we call the fitness landscape, selection will easily carry the species to the nearest peak, but there will be innumerable other peaks that will be higher, but which are separated by valleys. 
The problem of evolution, as I see it, is that, uh, that of a mechanism by which the species may continually find its way from lower to higher peaks in such a field. So that, that was actually a question that Sewell Wright um, sort of uh, pursued uh, throughout his career. And of course, one way in which uh, this, this getting stuck at a peak is avoided is by the fact that the fitness landscape is actually changing, right? So what is a, what is a peak in one situation may no longer be a peak in, in, in another situation. And, and so that's sort of what I want to uh, uh, discuss here. So we want, want to talk about changing fitness landscapes. And so in order to have a kind of well-defined uh, problem to think about uh, that one can also address experimentally, I want to look at a specific uh, uh, um, situation. Namely, I want to look at uh, the evolution of bacterial populations in the presence of antibiotic drugs, right? So essentially, if you, if, you, if you expose bacteria to antibiotics, and if these antibiotics are not, if the concentration of antibiotics is not sufficient to immediately kill the bacteria, what they will do is that they will evolve resistance and they will become resistant to the, to the, to the drug. And so um, <clears throat> this means that you can, you can sort of look at resistance evolution as an evolutionary phenomena that is governed by, by uh, of course, many parameters, but one important parameter, which is the, um, the, the, the drug concentration. And so this is a, a, a pick, a, an example um, <clears throat> from the group of Miriam Barlow, who looked at um, uh, populations of E. coli in the presence of a particular antibiotic called ampicillin. Um, uh, and, and they looked at all combinations of four particularly important mutations that occurred in a dedicated antibiotic resistance gene. So each of these landscapes corresponds to a different uh, concentration. And you can sort of see that these uh, uh, landscapes change. So this, this bold face thing here is the peak. And so you see that uh, they may or may not have the same peak, but other arrows sort of flip around. And so that's sort of the, the kind of dynamics that I want to talk about, the changing fitness landscape um, as a function of, um, uh, of antibiotic concentration. Um, now to, to set up a model for this process, uh, we need to um, know a little bit more about uh, what actually happens. So an, a crucial, um, a crucial um, uh, concept here is a concept of the dose response curve. So the dose response curve is simply the growth rate of the population as a function of drug concentration, right? So you, you put your bacteria, you expose them to the drug, and if the drug concentration is, low, is, is not too high, they will still grow, but they will grow more slowly. And so, so there will be a curve like this, where this is the antibiotic concentration, this is the growth rate. And so um, at some point, the growth rate will go to zero and then become negative. So beyond that, the bacteria, the, the death rate of the bacteria is higher than the birth rate. And this is called the minimal inhibitory concentration, MIC. Now, um, if, you, if, if now a resistance mutation occurs, this means that the, the bacteria can tolerate a higher concentration of, of, uh, of the antibiotic. And this then often happens in this way as indicated here. So here you have the, the initial bacterial strain, you, here you have the mutated strain. And so you see that the mutated strain now has a higher MIC, so it could tolerate a higher concentration of the antibiotic but it also has a lower growth rate in the absence of the antibiotic. And this is a very common occurrence, which is called trade-off. That is mutations that increase resistance often decrease the growth rate in the, in the absence of the drug. And so therefore these two growth, these two dose response curves cross and, and beyond the crossing point, the red uh, strain has a higher growth rate than the blue strain. And so this is called the selective window because in this region, um, uh, if, you, if you have both strains in your population, the, the resistance strain will grow. And so this is a, an important practical or, or medical problem, which is that antibiotic resistance can be selected also at low concentrations of the antibiotic, for example, in wastewater and in, in other um, uh, situations. <laughs> and this is just an, an, an example of, of two of these dose response curves for a particular, um, for a particular uh, experimental system. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So we have, these, we have to model these dose response curves. And then you see that when the dose response curves cross, this will mean that, that the, 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 the um, certain uh, um, 
strains will become fitter and other strains uh, become less fit. And so this is the basis on which we developed this model. So this is a, a work that was published in eLife uh, two years ago. And this is a collaboration with an experimental with experimentalists in, 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 in Edinburgh. And we call this the trade-off induced landscape model. So Joachim, a uh, quick yeah. question. Um, yes. So the, the, the dose response curves are assuming that in, in the, 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 the window of time where you're making those measurements, there is no mutations and, and, and yes, it, it, that's time. right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so right. So you're, you're, you're sort of measuring the growth rate on, on a short time scale where you, where you assure that, there, or, you know, you assume that there are no mutations. Yes. So if there are mutations, then this is, will of course falsify the measurement. So exactly. Yeah. So I have to do a kind of a short time, short time measurement. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, so this, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so this model is is based on 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 a, on a couple of uh, more detailed empirical observations. Um, so, so this is, uh, uh, and these are these exp these experimental data from the group of Bartek Vaslav and and Rosalind Allen, who were at the time in Edinburgh, and since then have have le actually both left the UK. Um, so this is now again E. coli in a, in a different antibiotic. So the you know I could say more about the antibiotics, but it's not really important for what I want to want to uh, explain here. So this is now this is now a set of dose response curves for different combinations of mutations, right? So the data set that uh, Bartek and Rosalind worked with um, uh, has a, a total of five different resistance mutations, and so these are some combinations of those. And so you see, you know, there there is a kind of pattern. So typically, as, as the, the um, um, resistance increases, the growth rate at, at low concentrations goes down. So it, it displays this kind of um, trade-off. But more importantly, uh, these, these curves actually scale, right? So this is, of course, something that, as a statistical physicist, you immediately want to try, right? So you can sort of try to, to scale the concentration. And here we scale them in such a way that they all reach uh, uh, 0.5 growth rate at, 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 the, uh, at the concentration, scaled concentration one, and you scale the growth rate to its value at zero uh, concentrations, and you get a rather nice data collapse. There is some issue here because at some point at, at very low growth rates, you cannot really resolve them. But overall, you see that there is a nice data collapse, and the, the, the scaling function here has the form of a so-called Hill function, uh, which looks like this. And so this means that you can now, each of these strains, which I indicate by sigma or these combinations of mutations can be characterized by just one, two parameters, namely the, what we call the null fitness, that is the growth rate at zero concentration and the scale for the concentration, which we call M sigma. And then there is a universal or a, a common uh, dose response curve that determines the shape. Um, so now, so here we still have now for each strain, we would have these two parameters. Now we can sort of look at these parameters in, in more detail. And, and this is what is done in this, in this table. So here you have the, the different strings. Um, and so, so the, 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 uh, what biologists call the non-epistatic uh, expectation, which simply means that you know, if you're assuming that the effect of these mutations on R and M are independent, then you would expect that the, uh, the, 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 the um, <clears throat> parameter of a certain combination sigma is just the product of the mutations that are present in that particular strain, which is expressed here. And essentially all the gray parts of this table are situations where this is true uh, up, to, uh, up to measurement error, right? There are some exceptions, uh, but in these, in these exceptional cases, it turns out that um, the, 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 the actual value is always smaller uh, than, than the true value, uh, which has which is sort of important for other reasons. But for now, I will just you know take this as sufficient evidence that we can assume that this is always true. At least this is what I will be assuming for the model. And so with that, we have we have sort of uh, uh, defined the ingredients for the model. So we have a total of L mutations. Uh, each mutation is characterized by a null fitness and a resistance value, and both of these are measured relative to what we call the wild type, which is just a string with all zeros. <laughs> and so with that, we can, we can define now the um, growth rate of a particular combination in this, in this form. 
uh, where this f is a is a monotonically decreasing shape function. Uh, a little bit later, we'll need a bit more specific uh, properties of this shape function, but it turns out that many uh, of the things that I will tell you actually don't really depend on what this shape function is. And, and as I said, the scaling parameters are now assumed to combine multiplicatively according to this. And the trade-off condition means that every additional mutation increases resistance, which means that these MIs are all greater than one, and it decreases the growth rate, which means that the RIs are less than one, right? And so if you now you know, want to make this into a kind of statistical physics model, uh, you can think of choosing these RIs and MIs at random from some distribution subject to this condition here. Okay, so, so let's see how this, how this now works. And let's start with the simplest case of just two mutations. Okay, so L equal to two. Uh, and so this is shown here. This is a, a particular, for a particular choice of these parameters, you see here now four dose response curves. You have the wild type, uh, you have the two single mutants and you have the double mutant. And you have these crossings, right? So, so these uh, dose response curves cross. So initially at low concentration, the wild type is the fittest one. So the fitness graph is shown here. And there's a single peak, which is at the zero, zero um, uh, 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 configuration. And so now here you have a crossing. So now the, the mutant number one uh, gets fitter. So now we're here. So this means that this arrow has flipped, right? Uh, a little bit later, uh, the, 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 uh, the second mutant also becomes fitter than the wild type. And so now we actually have two peaks, right? So now we have sort of in this graph, we have two uh, local, local fitness maxima. And then as you go on, at some point, this local fitness maximum uh, ceases to be, to be a fitness maximum. And at, at very large concentration, the ordering of these uh, lines has just reversed. So now the, the wild type has the lowest fitness and the double mutant has the highest fitness, right? And so what you see here, what, 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 what is sort of the mechanism of this, of this model is that um, the, the, as you increase the concentration, there's a kind of re-ranking of the fitness values. This flips the arrows in the fitness graph and, and uh, uh, the, the landscape evolves now in this case from single peak to two peaks and back. And what you can sort of imagine as you now have more mutations, presumably these, uh, you know, there will be more peaks. So the landscape at intermediate concentrations will be, can be rather complicated. Okay, and this is in fact the case. So this is now, um, uh, so now here we have uh, 16 mutations with randomly distributed Rs and Ms from a certain uh, distribution. And one way of sort of quantifying the ruggedness of this landscape is by just counting the number of local fitness peaks. And this is now the number of peaks as a function of concentration. So this dashed line here shows the total number of peaks and these other lines here show subsets of peaks. So it turns out, and, and this of course, you know, part of the construction of the model, as you increase the concentration, uh, more and more of these mutations become, uh, become uh, beneficial. And so the, 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 it, in fact, one can show that the number of uh, typical number of mutations that are present at concentration X scales as log X divided by the average of log MI. And so these are now uh, uh, peaks with, with four mutations, with six mutations and so on. So sort of the, the, the different classes of peaks become important. Um, but importantly, the, the total number of peaks is, grows exponentially with L, right? So there's an exponential uh, uh, number of peaks. Uh, remember the total number of sequences is two to the L. So, so some uh, fraction of these, which is also exponential in L are peaks at intermediate concentrations. Okay, so, so that basically is, is, is the model, right? Um, and so now what we want to look at, so now we want to sort of use this model to understand what happens when the fitness landscape changes uh, uh, by changing the concentration. Uh, and so, uh, and specifically we'll be interested in what happens under cyclic driving. So when you, when you sort of oscillate uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the concentration, and this is uh, uh, what was inspired by the collaboration with Muiti Mungan, who is uh, uh, an expert on, on disordered driven systems, uh, uh, sheared amorphous solids and other uh, uh, related paper, uh, related uh, um, uh, uh, systems. And, and so, so this is where we sort of discovered this, this nice analogy that I want to explain to you. And this was published in, in FISREF X a couple of, maybe two months ago. Uh, question please. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, just trying to imagine the landscape. So the hills and valleys. Are there lots of uh, saddle points also? I mean, in some sense. Yes. So are you, do you know the numbers? Uh, no, we haven't looked at that, but of course, yes. I mean, so, so you know, generally speaking, you know, for any any genotype, you can sort of count how many. You know, this is a discrete space, right? So, yeah. so for any genotype, you can count how many, In a, um, uh, how many sequences, uh, how many neighbors have lower fitness, and if all the neighbors have lower fitness, then uh, you have uh, you have a peak, right? And if, if one neighbor has a higher fitness, you have a saddle, and so on. You could you could do sort of more detailed statistics, but we haven't done that. All right. Okay. Are you working Kavita here? Yeah, hi Kavita. <laughs> yeah, so one question about this ruggedness. I mean, uh, so are they pretty correlated, uh, these landscapes are, uh, you know, highly un uncorrelated or very correlated? I mean, where's the ruggedness? Is this sort of intermediate? Yeah, they actually, they, they are highly correlated. They have some rather unusual uh, features, which I don't really have time to describe. But for example, there is a this theorem that, sorry? So if you sort of think in terms of NK landscapes or one of these models, can you say uh, where does these landscape roughly lie? Is the yeah, they are, are not really NK. They are not really NK-like. What is very important is that at a given concentration, most of the peaks have sort of the same number of ones, right? Um, and and so, so there is a remarkable theorem that Suman proved, which is that, that at any concentration, all the peaks are accessible by a monotonic path from the zero string, right? And this is, you know, this is certainly not true for most sort of generic models. So, so it's in that sense, it has a rather, these landscapes have a rather peculiar structure um, because of the way that they are constructed. Okay. Kavita, yes. Yes, Joachim, you can continue, please. Okay, very good. Um, right. So, 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 uh, to get to the next point, I need to make a, a, a digression uh, to another model that that at least I wasn't really aware of. Maybe some some of you know about this, and this is a so-called Preissach model. Uh, which was uh, invented by Ferenc Preissach, uh, who was uh, actually a, a student of Barkhausen, whom some of you might know from the Barkhausen noise, and, and worked uh, at, at Siemens in the 1930s. Uh, he unfortunately had, had to leave Germany uh, then shortly after the, the Nazis came to, uh, to power and, and later uh, died a tragic uh, death in, in Hungary. Um, so what Preissach uh, in, in, invented, or the model that is attributed to him, is the following. So this is a model of hysteresis. Um, it consists of uh, two-level systems, so L2-level systems called hysterons, and there is an external field. And each of these elements uh, has a kind of uh, intrinsic hysteresis. So this means that at low fields, uh, the elements take on the value zero. Of course, in a spin context, you might think that these are plus or minus one. But here we'll just stick to the zero one notation. Um, so, in, uh, and as you increase the field, there will be an upper switching field uh, where the, the 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 state switches to one. And then, if you go back, there is another switching field, a lower switching field H i minus, where you go back to zero. Right. So there's a kind of little hysteresic loop built into this model. But apart from that, all these hysterons are independent. So this has also been called a kind of ideal gas model of of um, uh, of 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 uh, uh, disordered um, uh, disordered magnets. Um, so so um, and and of course you know you can now choose these HIs at at, at random or, or in a, any other way that that you're interested in. Um, so now let's ask what are the the possible states that that the, the this Preissach system can take and and for that let me introduce a little bit of notation. So let me take a sequence sigma. And then let's define the sets of, of, of sites that have a value one and the set of sites that has value zero, right? So this is I plus of sigma and I minus of sigma. Um, and now you can ask what is, what, is, uh, what is a condition for a sequence to be a stable state of the Preissach model, which simply means that it's a state that can occur under this prime evolution. And so obviously what you need is that, that um, there, is a, there is a field integral where uh, uh, all the states, uh, so if you, if you lower the field, 
um, the, the lower switching field of all the states is, is, is above that field, right? So you have to be above the maximum of the lower switching field of all the states that could flip from one to zero. So the, 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 the hysterons in the set I plus. And similarly, you have to be below the switching field, the upper switching field of all this, the, the spins uh, in the set I minus, right? So if this condition is true, then there is a stability range H minus of sigma and H plus of sigma where the state is stable, right? And the set of all the states that are stable at some H is a set of stable states. Now, when you reach the boundaries of the stability range, then of course, one of the, 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 the um, spins will lose stability. So one, and, and this will be the first one that you encounter. So this we call uh, a sigma u. So this state then has to flip from zero to one. And this is the state where the switching field is exactly equal to the minimum of all the switching fields. And similarly, if you go down, if you, if you go to the lower uh, boundary of the interval, there is a state that has to flip from one to zero, right? So these are sort of forced, uh, uh, forced uh, um, uh, transitions that occur. Okay, so so and, and what I'm going to argue is that this model has is is in a certain sense equivalent to to the Till model that I introduced. So what are the stable states in the Till model? Uh, a natural definition is that a stable state is a local fitness peak, right? And so we're going to say that a stable state in the Till model is a sequence that is a local fitness peak at some con concentration x. And so let's again look at the picture uh, that, that we had before, right? So here, in fact, you see that at some concentration, all the four states can be peaked. So here, actually, all the states are stable. Uh, but for example, if you're at low concentration, then this is, a, this is a, a local peak. It loses stability when the red curve crosses the dashed curve, right? Um, and so at that point, uh, uh, you, you, the, the, this, this um, uh, zero, zero is no longer a peak and you have a new one, right? So generally you see that a stable state sigma will always lose stability when the dose response curve of that state crosses the dose response curve of a mutational neighbor, right? And, and so what you can see here from this example is that, that below that, um, uh, below that concentration, uh, the, the dashed uh, curve is above the red one. So this genotype has a higher fitness than the other. And here this, this has been reversed. And for that reason, the dashed genotype is no longer a peak, okay? Uh, okay, so, so now we, we can sort of construct, we can sort of map this Till model uh, to the Preissach model. And for that, we do the following. So we, 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 we fix the parameters Ri and Mi. And then we look for the solution of this equation, okay? So what this means, so to speak, physically, so this is the crossing point of the, the dose response curve of the wild type with the dose response curve of the, of the i-th mutant. So this is what we call previously the minimal selected concentration. And I'm going to assume that f is chosen such that this solution exists and is unique. So that's a constraint that one has, but, but that is relatively easy to fill, fulfill. So, so it's not so difficult to find its functions f where this is the case. Um, and so now, um, uh, given a sequence sigma and, and, and a spin that could in principle flip to, to, to from zero to one, uh, define sigma plus i to be the sequence obtained by flipping um, the spin from zero to one. And so now we want to determine the, the condition for the dose response curve of sigma and sigma plus i to cross, right? So this is written here. And now we can sort of exploit the multiplicative structure of the model. So you see, for example, R sigma plus I is simply R I times R sigma. And similarly, M sigma plus I is M I uh, times M sigma. So if we define X tilde as X over M sigma, you see that, that the condition is, is, is simply this, which is the same as the condition up here. And so you see that the two curves actually cross at a point given by M sigma times X I, right? So these xi's are sufficient to determine all the crossing points between all the curves. Um, and similarly, if you have a, a, have a spin that can flip from one to zero, um, uh, the crossing point will be given by m sigma times xj, til, uh, xj bar, where xj bar is xj divided by mj. Okay, so, so with that, we have established this, um, this uh, equivalence that is a sequence sigma is a stable state of the Till model if this condition holds, which is which is completely analogous to the um, uh, to the to the Preissach model, 
uh, with the uh, identification of the upper switching field as xi and the lower switching field as xi bar. And of course, by construction, xi bar is always less than xi. The only difference is that the stability range is in fact not x minus x plus, but it's m sigma x minus and m, m sigma x plus. And, and this will turn out to be important um, in a moment. But at this point, we have established a kind of a strict equivalence between the, the stable states in the two models. And this can be used, for example, to estimate how many stable states there are. So I told you before numerically that the number of peaks is, is exponentially large, but now you can actually do a computation. And so if these Ri's and Mi's are chosen independently and identically distributed for different i, then you find that the expected number of stable states grows exponentially in L with a, with a um, growth rate that you can express in terms of the probability distribution functions of x and x bar. So of course, x and x bar depend in some possibly complicated way on ri and mi, but in principle, this can be worked out. And that gives you a, a growth rate that is um, somewhere between zero and, and log two by construction. Okay, so now, now let's, let's uh, th think a little bit more about what actually happens when you reach, so suppose now we're, in, we're uh, at a certain concentration, which, which is uh, uh, where a certain state is, is stable. And now we move to the boundary of the stability uh, interval. Now in the Preissach model, um, it turns out that if you, when you reach the boundaries, um, there, will be, there will be another stable state and that stable state will then be a stable state at that concentration. So, so in fact, and, and this is maybe a bit you know, disappointing for a talk given, given in the honor of Deepak, there are actually no avalanches in the, in the Preissach model. This was shown by, by Terzi and Moitin Mungan uh, recently. So, 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 so in the Preissach model, you know, you just go from one state um, to the other as you change the, the field. But, but in the Till model, this is actually not the case. And, and the reason is that the stability range is actually not X minus X plus, but it's, it, it's shifted by the sigma dependent factor. And, and an example for that is already shown in this, in this uh, um, uh, canonical situation that I've been showing you already twice. Um, so for example, when, you're, you know, when you come from low concentrations, you will initially go to this peak. And at this point, of course, you're still at this peak, right? But at this point, this peak loses stability, but then you see that the next peak is actually two mutations away, right? So you cannot just move by one mutation and be in a stable state again. And so, so there has to happen. So what you have to do here is to either go uh, along this way or, or, or uh, well, you, uh, yeah, you have to go along, along here, right? Um, and so you actually have to do two mutational steps. And so uh, we call these secondary mutations, right? So in the, so in the TIL model, actually there, there are avalanches, right? So, so once a, a, a peak in the fitness landscape goes unstable, uh, you have to generally do multiple steps in order to reach a new peak. And uh, okay, so in, in this particular situation, this path was actually deterministic, but in general, in a larger fitness landscape, the secondary mutations can also be stochastic in the sense that there can be multiple possibilities where you can go to find a new peak. Okay, and, and this one can now, uh, to, to sort of visualize this dynamics, uh, one can draw a so-called state transition graph and so here now, uh, all these nodes in this graph are stable states, right? So this is L equal to five. So there are 32 uh, sequences altogether. This shows a subset of the sequences that are stable uh, at some concentration. And these arrows show where you go from a certain sequence when you increase the concentration in gray or you decrease the concentration in red, right? So each node here has arrows going out and in. And you see that there are, there are sort of two kinds of arrows. There are solid arrows. And so these correspond to a dynamics uh, that is greedy. So once you have these secondary mutations, you have to decide uh, a little bit more about the dynamics. And one possibility is that you say you always go to the fitness, you know, in, in each step you go, uh, you have to go uphill in fitness. And so you go uh, to the, to the uh, largest fitness of, of all your available neighbors. Uh, which is typically called a greedy dynamics, right? So, uh, but, if, and, uh, but if there are sort of other possibilities and these are indicated by these, by these dashed arrows um, and, and uh, uh, you see that, um, um, uh, you know, 
in, in different. So for example, in this situation here, you have a greedy transition going to this state and you have a non-greedy transition going to that state. Okay, so, so this is, so this is this uh, state transition graph sort of encodes the entire dynamics and you can you know think about what it what it predicts you can think about what that would do uh, under under certain uh, protocols of changing the concentration now i told you that there's an equivalence to the Preissach model so the same states you can define a Preissach model that has exactly the same states but it has a different graph right so the graph is now a graph which doesn't have any secondary uh, mutations, so it doesn't have any uh, any avalanches. So in this case, each node has just one outgoing gray arrow and one outgoing red arrow. Right? But of course, these these graphs are also rather rather interesting and and rather uh, complex. And, and Muiti Mungan and others have have uh, analyzed these uh, graphs in in great detail. Uh, generally speaking, the graph topology is a kind of depiction obviously of the ordering of the switching field right so that's essentially all the information that is in the model is is the ordering of the switching fields and so uh, one particular ordering where things are very simple is 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 a case when there are also no avalanches in the till model so one can show that in the till model the condition for secondary mutations or avalanches being absent is just this so that all the x's are sort of ordered sequentially and in that case the graphs are, are identical and are, are simple so then you just have a chain of, of states and since this chain of states has to go from all zeros to all ones it has l plus one stable states and that's actually also the minimum of the number of stable states that you can have uh, you, are Kim, you have exceeded yeah. 40 minutes i'm sorry yes i'm basically done <laughs> uh, let me just show okay so this is sort of an example of, um, of um, uh, a, um, uh, an empirical state transition graph uh, based on, um, on, on the empirical data by, by Mira and collaborators that I showed you in the beginning. And so this just to show you that in principle, you, know, you, 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 have, uh, you have similar phenomena in these systems. And in particular, of course, this graph also shows that there is hysteresis. That is, if you increase concentration, uh, you you, you uh, move on a different path than if you decrease concentration. And one can now within the model, one can sort of analyze the amount of hysteresis in more detail. One can look at how the number of, of the secondary mutation scales with L. And one can also look at how the, 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 the degree of irreversibility changes if you change the protocol, in particular, if you change the, um, if you change the concentration in steps rather than quasi-statically. Uh, so, so let me let me uh, summarize. So, so I've, I've shown you that there is um, there have been advant important advances advances in the empirical exploration of fitness landscapes, and therefore, and this is sort of what we what we're sort of working on. Uh, there is a, a need for a better understanding of their mathematical structures. I've shown you these changing environments, which induce a kind of dynamics on the set of fitness landscapes, and uh, this is particularly a nice application of this is, is uh, antibiotic resistance evolution and I've shown you this um, uh, this equivalence to the uh, to the Preissach model uh, and finally let me just mention that that uh, uh, th there is a special issue on random landscapes uh, and uh, dynamics in evolution ecology and beyond that we're, uh, uh, that I'm editing with some with some colleagues uh, and so there are already some interesting papers uh, from different areas of, of physics and also mathematical biology there. And so if you're interested in this uh, topic overall, then uh, please have a look. Okay, so let me let me uh, conclude and, and thank you for your attention and happy to answer more questions. <clears throat> so are there any questions? Yeah, okay, my, I'm a little confused about these secondary transitions you have uh, in the, because you, you, you did sort of say that there's an exact analogy to the Prizak model, uh, where the, when, when any uh, given state uh, makes a, tra I mean, when you make a transition from a given state, there's a unique uh, 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 destination state. Right. So, in other right. Words, in the, yeah, so there's only one one arrow that goes out of any node in your transition graph. Um, yeah. So, so, but, so, so let 
let me so, so the key point is really this one right so maybe uh, let me see I have it yeah so so the equivalence is in terms of the in terms of of the of the states right so so uh, I can compute these xi's and xi bars and I can identify them with uh, with uh, Preissach fields and then there is uh, the, 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 the states are exactly the same, but the difference is in the range of stability. So in the Preissach model, uh, you know, the, the range of stability of a of a of a of a of a, um, of a sequence um, is uh, is in this language would be x minus from x minus to x plus. But here it's x minus x plus. The whole interval is sort of shifted by uh, this m sigma, right, which depends on sigma and becomes, of course, bigger as you have more ones. So these stability intervals are sort of shifted along the concentration axis. And so as a consequence, the state that you reach when you go to concentration x plus uh, may not be a stable state in that interval, right, because the interval has sort of shifted away, right. So that's, that's why there are these, uh, these uh, secondary transitions. And so that, that means that in this graph, you know, there's not just one arrow going out of, uh, uh, well, actually, even, even the one arrow that goes out doesn't have to go to a neighboring state, right? So one has to sort of, one has to sort of distinguish here between two, two different situations. So here, what I showed you here is that when this guy goes unstable, there is a unique destination, but the destination is two mutations away, right? But in general, you can also have situations where there are multiple destinations. And, and this is what is shown here in the ca in, in, in cases where you have sort of multiple arrows going out of out of a node. But the, the key the key difference is really in in this in this relation for the stability interval. So uh, if you have those possibilities of multiple transitions, I mean, uh, when 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 the the transition involves uh, multiple mutations, doesn't that uh, at least allow the possibility of avalanches? You just you said. Yeah, sure. Avalanches. No, no, these are avalanches, definitely. Yeah, yeah, sure. These are avalanches. You know, and and, and this is you know this this plot here is sort of showing in some sense how big these avalanches are, right? So this is plotting the the mean number of secondary mutations. Uh, so you know they they are typically not extremely large. I mean they are not like you know SLC avalanches with a power law distribution, but 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 they do occur. Yes. Thanks. So, uh, Joachim, there is some work on this uh, random field Ising model where you have an Ising model with ferromagnetic coupling, but there is a random quenched field at its site and hysteresis on such a network will give very similar behavior. Yes. So, for example, if you take the coupling to be mean field type, it will reproduce your, uh, you know, the shift in the uh, the price values of the random the shift in the threshold fields. So you have so, so you're, did that, and you have. So, so you're you're talking about a random field Ising model on a graph, is that? Yeah. So you can take a square lattice with ferromagnetic okay. coupling, and mm -hmm. a random field quench random field at each side. Start yeah. with all spins down, and then you know slowly increase the field. And there is some avalanches and stuff which have been studied a lot by Sitna and other people. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. no of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah it is yeah, yeah. related. It's very similar to this model, except that you don't have only five mutations, but you can think of many more. And I was just wondering if the work on that one is related in some way to whatever you are discussing here. Yeah, I, I, yes, of course, I, of course, the, the, you know, the random field uh, Ising model is, is one of the, the paradigmatic models that, that people are studying in this, in the context of these driven disordered systems, right? Um, but but of course it's it's more complicated than than the Preissach model, right? I mean the Preissach is a kind of, uh, as I said, a kind of ideal gas uh, model in that context. Um, and and uh, I think there is a kind of uh, one thing that people are, are are sort of working on this in this uh, in this field is to to try to to go towards uh, more realistic models by introducing interactions between the hysterons in the Preissach model. And in some sense. You know, a simple kind of interaction is is what I describe by the shifting of the stability and uh, stability um, 
in the world. But of course, you know, a lot of, of course, a lot, of, a lot is known about, about, um, uh, you know, about the random field uh, Ising model in, in, in changing fields, uh, also in the context of Barkhausen noise and so on. Uh, and and, and uh, um, but the specific analogy or the specific equivalence uh, th that I have shown here is 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 with the price of model, which is much simpler than the random fieldizing model. If there are no more questions, let's thank both the speakers of this session. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye.